Hello, my name is Scott Shell. I'm the University of Wyoming Extension Entomology Specialist, and I'd like to talk to you today about reducing the risk of blister beetle hay contamination. Uh, you may have heard about a terrible incident that happened back at a horse boarding facility in Wisconsin where in January of 2020 uh, they had an incident where uh, some of the hay that they fed to the horses resulted in uh, the death of over a dozen and uh, the uh, injury uh, from blister beetles to many more. So certainly uh, you don't want that to happen whether it's uh, to your own livestock or to a customer's animals whether it's a high dollar a barrel racing horse or, or a kid's pet goat. So it's an important topic to talk about and uh, how to uh, reduce the risk of having blister beetles in your hay. Uh, hopefully you'll come away with something that will uh, reduce that for you. Just our standard disclaimer that if I mention products it is not an uh, endorsement of the extension service. The common name of the family Meloidae are blister beetles and the ones that cause problems in alfalfa all belong to the genus Epicotta. Uh, the, they vary in their color but they're similar in their size and their shape as you can see here. Um, they have some behaviors that make them the problematic members of the family in that they'll come in swarms to flowering plants and in, in the case of alfalfa if it's flowering that makes it uh, suitable for them. So epicotta, the root word of that is uh, cauterization uh, essentially like or caught to burn and cantheridin is the actual chemical that is in the body of these uh, blister beetles actually in their blood and it's odorless and colorless uh, it is potent uh, blistering agent and can blister skin and mucous mem membranes it, you can see here in the lower left picture is a blister beetle that's been probably pinched uh, and, and disturbed and it's uh, exuding this it's called reflexive bleeding from their joints and so uh, it's a defensive chemical if they're attacked by a predator or in the case of this other picture here probably a blister beetle got between his collar and his neck and uh, the fluid from the beetle caused this blister on his skin. So you can imagine uh, the damage it could cause if an animal consumes it in, in the digestive tract in the mouth. So very uh, a nasty chemical that the cantheridin is. All of the blister beetle species that are potential problems in alfalfa hay utilize the grasshopper egg pods for their larval uh, food. Uh, the uh, life cycle here is pictured and in the upper right corner shows the first instar uh, from the egg and they're mobile and they uh, after hatching they search out and look for grasshopper egg pods which are deposited in the upper layer of the soil they dig down to them and then start feeding on them and as they molt they become less and less mobile uh, you can see here in the lower left picture uh, the brown cylindrical objects are grasshopper eggs and then these are a couple of the larvae of the blister beetles that have been pulled out of the egg pods so in, in a way they can be beneficial in that they uh, help control grasshoppers but uh, the problems that they cause when they get into our hay is is probably not a good trade-off. So how toxic are the blister beetles? Uh, the striped species is the most toxic. Uh, it has never been collected in Wyoming but there's no geographic barrier from its known range in Nebraska and South Dakota so it could possibly be here but I've not seen it. There is a smaller species that does not gather in masses of, of, um, on flowers like the striped blister beetle does. It is another blister beetle. It's a pyrota species. You can see it doesn't have the stripes that extend further up onto its what's pronotum and head. The black uh, blister beetle is our most common one here in Wyoming. It is the least toxic of these uh, uh, species that are commonly uh, found on uh, swarming on alfalfa. The gray, solid gray or spotted gray uh, are intermediate in toxicity. So they, they de definitely none of them are good to, to have uh, in your hay, uh, but uh, the blister, the striped blister beetle is the most toxic. 
So how do the blister beetles, or, or actually the toxin that they contain, get uh, their exposure to our livestock? And these particular blister beetles uh, will gather in masses on blooming alfalfa and other plants. A lot of them will chew on a lot of different plants. They have a broad host range of plants, but they do like to have uh, uh, flowering plants. The females will go there. Uh, they seem to like to eat uh, pollen from the flowers and then the males are more interested in just mating with the females uh, so th the beetles uh, if they are killed and incorporated into the hay or, or even not even fully incorporated just their body fluids are smeared on the hay can cause uh, poisoning uh, like say uh, horses are more sensitive to the uh, poison but certainly all classes of livestock uh, are at risk uh, of poisoning if exposed to the contaridin. Uh, in doing some research on the blister beetles there are species of insects that prey on them that are tolerant of the poison. Uh, I've found uh, literature that references some birds uh, that will consume at least one before rejecting them and then uh, toads uh, uh, can also seem to eat them without uh, dying from it. So how toxic are these things? Well, uh, the literature varies, but anywhere from 25 to 120 of the striped blister beetles, the most toxic species, can kill a horse. Um, they are about twice as toxic as the gray species and about five times as toxic as the black. So uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of these insects, which are relatively small, uh, only about three, quarter, three eighths of an inch to a half inch long, uh, to uh, cause a horse to become ill. Uh, now we have to keep in mind there are other risks of feeding hay to horses or livestock. Certainly, uh, you know, if the hay uh, was put up and it got moldy, uh, that, can, that can cause issues with the horse health uh, like uh, the heaves. Um, anaerobic conditions and moisture in these really super tight bales can cause uh, the formation of the or the growth of the bacteria that produces botulism toxin. I knew a lady who lost a couple of horses to botulism. Uh, poisonous weeds, if they're accidentally harvested in the hay, uh, can kill animals. And then uh, just the ingestion of twine or net wrap, or uh, when we used to use uh, uh, baling wire on our, our hay, you'd get twist offs and get a little fragments of wire that could cause injury to your uh, livestock. So, uh, again, certainly. You know, we want to try to reduce all risks and so by knowing more about the blister beetles hopefully you, you can reduce that risk for your uh, your own uh, livestock and your potential customers. Again certainly you want to reassure your customers especially uh, horse owners because uh, you know whether it's somebody's $100,000 barrel horse or uh, their child's uh, prize uh, Shetland pony uh, you, you don't want to injure your customers livestock that's not good for business uh, but there are other things uh, that can cause problems. Uh, certainly this is an illustration of one where um, the, the net wrap off of a round bale uh, was consumed by a horse and had to be removed surgically. Besides the difference in sensitivity to the contheridin toxin, uh, I think how hay is fed between livestock classes also makes a huge difference in susceptibility. Uh, most horses are fed, uh, you know, perhaps in mangers, uh, uh, you know, buckets, uh, some type of feeder. And uh, if they're like my pasture pets, they lick their food clean. Uh, whereas uh, cattle, a lot of times, you know, a big round bale or a big square bale is spread out on a pasture. Uh, they jostle back and forth. Uh, you know, no cow gets uh, to eat all at one spot. Uh, so in the case of a horse that had a flake of hay thrown in there that contained a big uh, batch of these dead blister beetles, uh, certainly uh, be very prone to getting a lethal dose. So integrated pest management or IPM uh, is utilizes multiple ways to try to reduce pest pressure and and so that's what I want to talk about is okay how can we use IPM to reduce the risk of blister beetles harvest timing is pretty critical if you can 
cut hay, especially hay that is meant for the horse market when there's little or no bloom in the field, you know, you've reduced the risk greatly because it's the blooming alfalfa that attracts blister beetles to swarm. Uh, now, it's not just alfalfa. Other forage legumes in bloom can be swarmed by blister beetles, but alfalfa is certainly the most common uh, crop that we uh, have that problem with in Wyoming. Uh, in Wyoming, uh, the first cutting is when our predominant species, the black blister beetles, population is the lowest. Uh, you know, they will emerge and the majority of the population will be out and active later in the summer because that's when actually most of the grasshopper egg pods become available for their offspring is, is in uh, summer, midsummer to late summer to early fall. So certainly uh, that's important to keep in mind is, is harvest timing is number one is uh, try not to cut hay, especially hay meant for the horse market uh, when there's a lot of blooms in it. Another IPM step to reduce the risk would be uh, your harvest practices, trying to avoid crushing and incorporating the beetles in the hay. Um, in studies out of Kansas State, uh, they looked at uh, different types of machinery and found that uh, the blister beetles could survive going through a swather or a windrower, uh, however you term that, uh, if the conditioner or crimper rolls were opened up so it wasn't crushing the, the beetles and the stems. Now, of course, that uh, there is a downside. Uh, the hay won't dry down as fast if you don't have those stems cracked. But again, you know, if this is meant for the horse market, if you can get a premium for having hay that has, you know, uh, the reduced risk of blister beetles, then that's probably worth it. Um, I also tried to research if there was a specific time of day or temperatures when the beetles aren't swarming. I did find that in really hot climates, they will get off of plants and get out of the sunshine when it's uh, too hot, like at midday. Uh, and I found that they become inactive uh, when temperatures get much below about 55, but that, you know, you'd probably, in a warm summer day, you might not get down to that point even at night. So uh, again, uh, you might uh, be something if, you, if you're if you in a situation where your hay has gotten into bloom and you're seeing blister beetle activity either in your hay fields or in the weeds surrounding it, uh, uh, checking out and seeing what they're doing during the heat of midday uh, may allow you a chance to put the hay down without the beetles present on the plants. One thing to keep in mind is even if you've got your swather with the conditioner rolls opened up so it's not crushing the hay, uh, on the outer uh, swaths of the hay field where you do your turns, uh, your wheels can crush them into the, uh, the windrows. Uh, so uh, in, you might want to open up the field and not uh, cut back and forth, let those outer uh, swaths dry down and, and pick them up and harvest them. It's also thought that the uh, outer edges of fields are more likely to have blister beetles. So they'll, they'll be coming out of the areas like the fence rows and burrow ditches that uh, where grasshoppers lay most of their eggs and and you know, then also you might have flowering weeds in those areas and, and so the blister beetles could come into the field there. So it's something to keep in mind because uh, in a study out of Kansas State, they even found that uh, say with the sickle bar cutting hay, uh, if you were uh, driving on that hay uh, and the beetles were still on there, you could crush them onto it. So certainly uh, you're doing taking steps that you know, modifying your harvest uh, such that you avoid crushing the insects is important. Certainly having uh, you know the machinery operator, uh, whether it's yourself or your hired man or a family member, being aware of, of blister beetles, what they look like and, and why they might be in the field uh, and try to avoid uh, harvesting them uh, with your machinery is a good idea. But uh, with modern machinery at the speed at which it travels down the field and the width of the headers on that, it's probably um, uh, going to be difficult. But again, you know, being aware of it, so uh, if you see them uh, and you know they're in the field and, and then take additional steps to try not to harvest them uh, is, is a good thing to keep in mind. 
weed control around your fields to prevent uh, flowering weeds from attracting blister beetles to there which may bridge into your alfalfa field is another uh, possibility of, of a step to take uh, you know most time you know, weed control is a pretty good idea to begin with you don't want to spray the weeds while they're in bloom because that might affect uh, beneficial pollinators like honeybees from local apiaries or something like that but if you prevent the weeds from going into bloom in the first place you know then that's no problem Well, you might think that, well, blister beetles are an insect. Why can't we use insecticides to kill the blister beetles in the alfalfa before the harvest? Well, most of the insecticides that are labeled for blister beetles require at least a seven-day pre-harvest interval. So if you have alfalfa that's blooming already and it's attracted in blister beetles, and then you uh, spray those blister beetles, uh, you'd have to wait seven days. And so the alfalfa would get even further into bloom. The other problem with that is uh, unless you have your own airplane or can do chemigation, you know, you're going to be driving on your crop, smashing down uh, alfalfa, losing uh, tonnage. So certainly that's uh, probably not a good idea. The other problem with them is that uh, you may not uh, realize this but the blister beetles are, can fly and they're they're mobile and so uh, in Kansas they documented them you know they would inspect a field and between the time the field was inspected and declared clear and harvest machinery would go in there they could find blister beetle swarms so again uh, it's uh, you know not that simple I think the best idea is to keep the blister Distributals out of the field um, and, and, and not harvest when the, uh, the crop is attractive to them. I do think that uh, insecticides have a role to play in uh, reducing the risk of blister beetles. It's an IPM step in that. Remember I talked about their life cycle. Uh, grasshopper egg pods are critical to them. So if we control grasshopper populations around our, our hay fields, then we've reduced their habitat and will reduce the uh, the populations of blister beetles. Because there's, if there's no egg pods, there's going to be no uh, uh, young blister beetles the next year so again you know that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do and also you get the benefit of having fewer uh, grasshoppers uh, and also uh, suppressing them which can damage your alfalfa or other crops so certainly uh, you know in flood irrigated alfalfa almost all of the grasshopper problems that you get come from the edges of the field the borrowed ditches the fence rows those types of things I have seen uh, where sprinkler irrigated alfalfa uh, can produce uh, grasshoppers right in their field but uh, again uh, it's mainly uh, coming from the fence rows and borrowed ditches and so I'm going to tell you some more about how to control grasshoppers which hopefully will reduce the risk of blister beetles in your field the current University of Wyoming recommendation for protecting crops from grasshoppers involves uh, the use of the uh, chemical insecticide diflubenzron and it's uh, originally it was sold as Dimlin 2L but there's other generic brands now Cavalier Unforgiven uh, there's probably more that I'm not aware of and you can utilize this very effectively against the grasshoppers and it, it it's uh, pretty uh, target specific because of the way you apply it and the behavior of the grasshoppers but you need to treat the areas where the grasshoppers are coming from so again the fence rows borrowed ditches uh, like the corners around uh, uh, circles irrigation circles um, and, and get those grasshoppers treated early because the the Diflubenzron works great, but it only works on the nymphs, so you got to apply it early. Uh, you can use it in these non-crop areas, and it's very economical in those in those situations as compared to products that you would uh, actually uh, would apply in your alfalfa field. So again, um, for non-crop areas, the label is a cut and paste here that explains it, uh, but you can utilize uh, two fluid ounces of, of the diflubenzron per uh, acre uh, and, and again that uh, should give you at least 30 days of residual control and again uh, it, this is a, a product that's not a neurotoxin it has a zero day grazing restriction so uh, animals are not uh, hurt by it other than the immature insects that consume it and I will explain how it works against them then 
So the diflubenzron works on insects that are immature, that eat it, and, and then when they go to molt, it will kill them. And so it's not a neurotoxin, it only affects the chitin that is in the exoskeleton of insects. So the majority of our pest grasshoppers overwinters eggs in the ground, and that's what the blister beetles are utilizing. So if we reduce their population, we reduce the blister beetle population too. Uh, grasshoppers, to, to be killed by it, have to be immature so uh, they haven't have their fully developed wings and are smaller they're not sexually mature at this point if they consume the, the dimelin that will interfere with the molt which is usually done hanging upside down on vegetation and then this is what it looks like after they've tried to molt after they've ingested dimelin they're caught up in their old exoskeleton they're rupturing uh, they, they uh, essentially uh, will die uh, other uh, insects and, and scavengers will clean them up and you won't even you know they'll just kind of melt away essentially uh, there's no dead insects laying everywhere it's uh, because it's protects things like the pollinators uh, they are not picking up and eating the vegetation that's been treating treated with the dimlin and uh, even predatory insects are usually adults and and will not be affected by this because it's it has to be consumed as an immature insect to be The grasshopper crop pests uh, are all belong to the genus Melanoplus that affect alfalfa and are usually found in association with alfalfa fields. So you got the migratory, differential, two-striped, and red-legged. Uh, I put up the pictures of the nymphs because that's what you're going to target is the nymphs when they start hatching. When they hatch out of the ground, they're about the size of a grain of rice, but they still look like a miniature grasshopper. Uh, yeah. If you combine all four of these species, they can have a hatching period up to 52 days long. So you're probably going to have to treat at least twice. You'll treat early and, and knock off that part of the population. And then if you have continued hatch after the residual of about 30 days on the diflubenzron, you'll want to treat again. And that will fully suppress the grasshopper population around the, your crop fields and hopefully suppress your blister beetle population as well. <clears throat> there are multiple ways to treat the small areas, the, the fence rows, burrow ditches where these crop pest grasshoppers can hatch out in enormous uh, numbers. Uh, like this ATV, a lot of ATVs are set up for spraying herbicides. You can also then utilize them to use, uh, use di diflubenzeron and treat those limited areas. This is showing a boomless nozzle, the spray pattern with just water uh, shooting out in one direction. So you know you could drive along your fence rows, your burrow ditches and treat those rather easily. The diflubenzeron is a restricted use pesticide uh, so you need to get your applicator's license. The uh, There are other options that are not restricted use such as uh, the carbaryl or better known as seven or uh, the uh, malathion perhaps but uh, again they have much shorter residue uh, periods so again the diflubenzron is superior for this use and is worth going to the effort to get it and utilize it so there are many different types of spray rigs that you can set up to treat these limited areas. Uh, there's also uh, uh, products with uh, uh, baits for grasshoppers, poison baits that really target grasshoppers well. Again, they don't have the long residual, so you will have to do more than one application. Because remember, the grasshoppers, uh, all four of those species from beginning to end can span, uh, you know, over 50 days. So essentially, um, you'll want to do uh, good a job of controlling them in order to uh, suppress their population and in, uh, in turn suppress the blister beetles. So there's there's more information out on the internet as you probably know about blister beetles and the risk to alfalfa hay and livestock. Uh, the Merck Veterinary Manual is online and you can read about the uh, uh, the symptoms of, of blister beetle intoxication and, and what treatments are available. Uh, again, prevention is the best thing to do. Uh, Kansas State University Extension has a very informative bulletin, MF959, available uh, that is, is uh, a good read. It, you can get it here at this web address or you can also search for these words, Kansas State Blister Beetle MF959, and that should bring it 
to you. Um, if you have any questions about blister butyl IPM or grasshopper control, I'll be happy to try to answer them or put you in touch with somebody who can. Uh, this is my phone number, and again, my name is Scott Shell. My email address is sschell at uwyo.edu. So again, um, I want to thank you for your time and attention, and hopefully this will uh, enable you to reduce your risk of blister beetle contamination in your hay, whether it's for your own personal use on your farm or ranch, or if you're selling it commercially.